cross-examination. The other side never brought it up. They never argued against it. They just left it. Here's an example. Um, many of you may know that a few months ago, the genetic code of the chimpanzee was published. Therefore, we can compare our genome to these primate relatives. What do we find? I want to show you one striking finding that dates to about a year ago. You all know that evolution argues that we share a common ancestor with the great apes, the chimpanzee, the gorilla, and the orangutan. Well, if that's true, there should be genetic similarities, and in fact, there are. But there's something that's really interesting and has the potential, if it were true, to contradict evolutionary common ancestry. And that is, we have two fewer chromosomes than the other great apes. We have 46, they all have 48. That's very interesting. Now, what does that actually mean? Well, first of all, um, the 46 chromosomes that we have, you got 23 from mom and 23 from dad. So it's actually 23 pairs. These guys have 24 from each parent, so they have 24 pairs. So everybody in this room is missing a pair of chromosomes. Now, where did it go? Could it have gotten lost in our lineage? Uh-uh. If it got lost, if a whole primate chromosome was lost, that would be lethal. So there's only two possibilities. And that is, if these guys really share a common ancestor, that ancestor either had 48 chromosomes or 46. Now, if it had 48, 24 pairs, which is probably true, because three out of four have 48 chromosomes, what must have happened is that one pair of chromosomes must have gotten fused. So we should be able to look at our genome and discover that one of our chromosomes resulted from the fusion of two primate chromosomes. So we should be able to look around our genome. And you know what? If we don't find it, evolution is wrong. We don't share a common ancestor. So if, how would we find it? Well, biologists in the room will know that chromosomes have nifty little markers. They have markers called centromeres, which are DNA sequences that are used to separate them during mitosis. And they have cool little DNA sequences on the end called telomeres. What would happen if a pair of chromosomes got fused? Well, what would happen is the fusion would put telomeres where they don't belong in the center of the chromosome, and the resulting fused chromosome should actually have two centromeres. One of them might become inactivated, but nonetheless, it should still be there. So we can scan our genome, and you know what? If we don't find that chromosome, evolution's in trouble. Well, guess what? It's chromosome number two. Our chromosome number two was formed by the fusion of two primate chromosomes. Uh, this is the paper from Nature a little more than a year ago. And I put up a little of the paper. I'm sorry it's technical, but look at what it says. Chromosome 2 is unique to our lineage. It emerged as a result of the head-to-head -head fusion of two chromosomes that remain separate in other primates. Those of you who have not kept up with how much we know about the genome uh, should pay attention to this, because you'll be amazed at how precisely we can look at things. The precise fusion site has been located at base number 114,455,823. 214,455,838. In other words, within 15 bases. And you'll notice multiple subtelomeric duplications. The telomeres that don't belong, and lo and behold, um, the centromere that is inactivated corresponds to chimp chromosome 13. It's there, it's testable, it confirms the prediction of evolution. How would intelligent design explain this? Only one way, by shrugging and saying, that's the way the designer made it. No reason. No rhyme. Presumably, there's a designer who designed human chromosome number two to make it look as if it was formed by the fusion from a private ancestor. Um, I'm a Roman Catholic. I'm a theist. In, in the broadest sense, I would say I believe in a designer. But you know what? I don't believe in a deceptive one. I don't believe in one who would do this to try to fool us. And therefore, I think this is authentic. And it tells us something about our ancestry. Probably the most likely reason why at this trial he's referring to intelligent design advocates had nothing to say is not, he, see, this is the problem with this guy, you know. That doesn't prove anything that they had nothing to say or not. It's totally irrelevant. Just give us the scientific data and that's it. That's what I'm going to do today. Okay, so anyway, the, the probably the reason is because they didn't know what to say yet. They needed time to think. Okay, I mean, it's taken me a little while to figure out well, not too long. I just started working on it. I worked on this a little last year and then forgot about it and then worked on it again uh, recently. But, I mean, it's, it takes a little while to think of th things. They probably didn't know what to say yet. Maybe they didn't even see the data yet, okay? Uh, and maybe, you know, time needed to get worked out for the first refutation of chromosome 2 as genetic uh, 
evolution evidence, which is uh, you know what this show here today presents. See, people probably interpret what I just said a second ago as, oh, see, you've got a pre-existing conclusion that human evolution is false, so therefore you're just trying to steer the evidence a certain way. No, that's not true. I used to be an evolutionist, and I have an undergrad degree in anthropology from the U of New Mexico, and it was that degree which got me questioning it, because I went into it head first loving evolution. This is way, way back in the 1990s when I got my undergraduate degree, but uh, when I, I found out that, you know, they never really were presenting me with any evidence for evolution. They never brought up DNA evidence, but that was before the mapping of the human genome, and they probably didn't have it, but see, that's pretty bad, because, you know, all they had is certain kinds of fossils to present, and those actually, you look at those, and they actually are evidence against the, them being our ancestors. You just have to have a wild philosophy attached to the observations to think that these monkey-looking things could somehow have a uh, ancestral linkage to us, which is completely unverifiable. So, anyway, there's uh, one of the um, spokespersons, so to speak, for this idea that chromosome 2 is a fusion, involves a fusion of two pre-existing chromosomes. Of course, the basic idea is that he assumes that the two were once apart. Okay, now, some people hearing this will say, well, of course he assumes that the two were apart. What else would be the case? But see, the problem, there's two problems. One, nobody ever saw it happen. There's no evidence that the two became one. And the second problem is, is that it requires a progressionistic thinking that species change into one another and so forth. You're, you're involving the assumption in, of your conclusion in the premises that there's a progression of species and creatures. This is circular reasoning. Okay, the definition of circular reasoning, when you start with your conclusion and then arrive at your conclusion, that's in logic, circular reasoning. This is what is going on here in saying that chromosome, t it's going to take me two hours to spell this all out for you, and I'm going to give you the most meticulous data and some of the most interesting things you've ever heard on this radio show, especially when we talk about Mount St. Helens and the Grand Canyon and, and the age of the earth, some of those issues, which the academic establishment just completely blows off, and it's just a travesty that they do. They're just denying empirical evidence. At least, you know, refute the claims that have been made by certain creationists would be nice, <laughs> you know, so we, we could know if they're, if they're so wrong. I want to know. Okay, so but instead they just ignore them. Uh, I think they have to ignore them because the evidence is so staggering. Well, you'll see when we get there. But what he's doing is he's he here. You have to think about. You have to really unlearn what you have learned. You have to really redo. You have to clear your mind of all the philosophies and theories that you've been given, and just focus on what you can see with your eyes. Just focus on your empirical life, your scientific perspective what your experiences tell you that's really what you have to you have to get back to that position on this show in order to grasp what we're saying grasp the real science differentiated from the pseudoscience of evolution and all its wild philosophies now see so what happens is is he starts off with this idea that there's a progression of creature to creature to, or sorry species to species to species they're all proliferating and splitting up with co-ancestors and forming new species and so forth and then he says ah okay so that's where I start so now when I see a, a variation between two creatures well one must have come from the other see there's the the built-in assumption right there that he started with one must have come from the other so therefore the uh, the variation I see in the DNA must have been such where there was an event in the past where a change happened, a fusion or a slicing or whatever of, of the DNA. And then you arrive at the conclusion, which is, ah, there's a proliferation of species and species differentiating and uh, splitting into different species, and that's why we have all this diversity. So just the most classic... Uh, circular reasoning there is now some people say no that's not circular reason because we have evidence for uh, the pro proliferation of species and species changing into other species in this progression and if I if somebody says they, we have evidence I ask them sh please show me one time ever ever in the natural world or even in, I don't even know of instances in a laboratory maybe there, I'm sure there are were these highly contrived, unnaturalistic scenarios that wouldn't occur in, in nature were presented where a species could change into another species. But I don't know many, but that doesn't even matter. Let's take what actually is about, you know, the real world has to do with. Somebody show me an instance ever where a species changes into another species, and you can't. It's totally 
So don't. So somebody can't start off by saying, "Well, of course he he starts off with the assumption that there's uh, species changing in other species and this progression of species through time," because that's just what happens. Well, if if you can't see it and you don't have any evidence for it and there's no empirical uh, instances for it, then it's not. Uh, it's an assumption. It's a wild philosophy, and this is a classic definition of circular reasoning. So here's a clip of none other than the world famous uh, Richard Dawkins discussing how we specifically don't see species changing into other species. He's just saying it right here. But he asks us, oh, but you just have to believe that they did in the past. You can't see it now. Okay, so but you have to trust my wild pseudoscientific philosophy that they did. So check this clip out. It's in response.